uh, it thrills me to no end to have uh, John Winkle, CEO of the Stanford Partnership, a really cool initiative. John, welcome to the summit. Welcome to uh, this morning. And take it away. You're going to be interviewing uh, Mr. Congressman Jim Hines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congressman, welcome. Hey, John. Good morning. So we're here from the Greenwich uh, CIO Summit, and uh, today's uh, summit topic is the carbon neutral CIO. Um, and so uh, really exciting uh, session here th this morning with Jim. Um, welcome, and thank you for your service, uh, Jim, first and foremost. Um, I don't know if everyone knows your background here, so uh, if you don't mind, I can just start with that. Um, Jim is uh, Connecticut's fourth, uh, serves in Connecticut's fourth district uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives, where he is serving, believe it or not, uh, his seventh term. Um, he uh, is chair of National uh, Security, International uh, Development and Monetary Policy Subcommittee of the House Financial Services Committee, where he also serves, uh, and also serves on the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Um, that committee uh, conducts oversight um, in, on the United States intelligence community uh, and also includes the intelligence and intelligence related activities uh, of 17 different elements of the US government. Uh, and Jim also serves on the uh, Defense and Intelligence Warfighter Support Subcommittee and uh, Strategic Technologies and Advanced Research uh, Subcommittee. Uh, Jim's a Harvard grad, Oxford grad, Rhodes Scholar. Recording in progress. Um, just a few more things, Goldman alum and uh, prior to uh, being in Congress, uh, uh, ran the New York City branch of Enterprise Community Partners, uh, which is a nonprofit uh, which addresses uh, unique challenges of urban poverty. Um, and then I'll just end on a personal note, you know, saying I've, I've personally seen and uh, uh, Jim is a big champion for innovation and responsible uh, technology development. Um, and he does a lot for, for this community. And uh, we're lucky to have him and, and welcome Jim. Thanks, John. It's great to be with you. And great to be great to be with all of you as well. Thank you for uh, inviting me. <clears throat> so circling back to um, the, the matter at hand here, the carbon neutral CIO, I'll open with a couple uh, recent developments in quotes, uh, and then we'll, we'll look to get Jim's uh, comments on this. So the big thing recently in, in climate change is COP26. As a lot of you know, that's the UN Climate Change Conference. Uh, Biden stated there, the United States is not only back at the table, uh, but hopefully leading by the power of our example. Um, and then he also recently released uh, some targets for the United States, cut U.S. greenhouse gases um, by well over a gigaton by 2030, reduce U.S. emissions uh, by 50 percent below 2005 levels, also by 2030, um, and also achieving uh, net zero by no later than 2050. So big aspirational goals at COP26. And uh, Bill Gates also stated there, uh, writing on his blog, you know, one, one of his top priorities here at COP uh, is making sure the world prioritizes scaling clean technology innovation and saying if we're going to avoid the worst climate disasters, uh, this is an urgent call to action. So um, bringing it back to, to Jim here, there's obviously, you know, the world is thinking about this, CIOs are thinking about this, CIOs that want to uh, lead carbon neutral organizations or care about carbon neutrality, uh, obviously are, are leading their organizations in this area. Um, so what is the current prominence of environmental concerns and sustainability uh, in your work at the federal level? And sort of what is the what is the current sense of urgency on it? Yeah, great, great question, John. Um, and, and let me let me try to be let me try to give you a succinct, succinct answer to that question. Um, first, while I think they're helpful, I'm not too impressed, frankly, with, you know, uh, targets set in Glasgow or anywhere else. Right. I mean, we've got data issues. Um, uh, did I just lose my, uh, am I coming through? Okay. You got you. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, look, I think it's great to set these targets, and, um, but you know, it's not, it's not enough, right. Um, you know, uh, as we saw, we'll come in and out of the Paris agreement, depending on who is, uh, on who is president, we've got data issues. Um, I'm, I'm much more impressed by initiatives that the government is taking at every level and in, 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 in recent times, more importantly, uh, uh, initiatives that the private sector is taking. Um, what about on the government side? Um, if we were really serious um, about reducing carbon, we would do something that we're not even talking about, right? We would 
impose a fee, a tax, depending on how you want to talk about it, you're going to choose that. You, we would correctly price carbon, right? We would, in terms of the uh, economists, we would price in the externalities for the use of carbon. That ought not be a uh, difficult issue to, 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 to understand. We've done it with, you know, uh, sulfur dioxide, with, uh, you know, with green, with um, uh, uh, the uh, ozone gases some time ago. But it is, it is, and it is for a bunch of reasons, right? Florida makes all of its electricity by burning stuff. West Virginia still has a lot of coal miners. So it is, it is a politically difficult issue. Um, uh, but, you know, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. And I'm sorry about that, because I do think there's a way we could do that in such a way that would incentivize the market to develop sustainable alternatives more rapidly. So since we're not doing that, we're doing a bunch of other stuff that feels to me like important, but but has sort of a patchwork quality to it. Right. And, you know, I think it is probably 60 percent probable that in the next two weeks we'll, we will pass uh, the famous Build Back Better plan. Uh, which would have the biggest investment ever, frankly, $550 billion in uh, sustainable clean energy. That's everything from, you know, charging stations to research and development to all of the things that sort of move us in the direction of sustainability. Nuclear, by the way, which irritates my environmental friends no end, but is really important to, um, uh, really important to our thinking in this regard. And the bill that we actually passed last week, the infrastructure bill, it was actually criticized for being untraditional, right? It wasn't just roads and bridges. No, it wasn't just roads and bridges, right? It had a lot of resources for things like uh, electric vehicle charging networks, et cetera. So, um, uh, you know, we're doing that. We're providing the incentives uh, through things like green banks, uh, through tax incentives on the purchase of electric vehicles. We're providing incentives. We are not mandating really anything. Um, you know, it is unlikely in these polarized times that the federal government will be issuing a lot of mandates. It's um, actually co controversial here in the state of Connecticut, where it's not as nearly as, as polarized, um, which leads me to my last point, which is um, I am really excited about what the private sector is doing here. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the motivations there are a combination of understanding how very severe this problem is responding to consumer demands. Consumers obviously are, are, are swayed by the disasters they see happening around the globe um, to demand of their, uh, you know, Walmarts and software companies and transportation companies um, a real, real attention to that. And, and I actually think that's enormously valuable. I think, um, you know, what consumers are feeling right now is reflective of what I see in the political realm, which is gradual understanding of the downside of not doing anything here. 10 years ago, that was controversial, certainly where I work. Today, I think, with a few rare exceptions, um, people understand that we've got to address this. And just because of the sort of very polarized, very angry politics we have, I do think that apart from the two pieces of legislation I just mentioned, most of the action is going to be um, voluntary inside the, inside the private sector. Oh, wonderful, Jim. Thank you. The um, so circling back to, to Biden on, on COP26, I want to just pull out a, a single quote from what he said, which was, you know, we're, we're going to be leaders here in the U.S. again. Um, and so just sort of curious, you know, for your for your opinion, how does the U.S. go back to a leadership position, maybe the top position on, on you know, addressing or tackling climate change? Well, I think the answer, John, if I can be succinct here, is, is most importantly our actions, right? Um, you know, uh, and then the symbolic things that we do. You know, when you've, when you've deliberately walked away from the Paris Climate Agreement, whatever you think of the Paris Climate Agreement, you're obviously sending a pretty, signal, a pretty important signal that you're not interested in leading here. Um, but what I'm really interested in, again, it's not so much the targets, it's not so much the symbolism, is what are you actually doing? Um, and, you know, I, I think that we can say with the uh, passage of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, and yes, it had its detractors, but it was bipartisan um, that, in, that invests a lot of money in next generation uh, transport in particular, right? In mass transit, biggest investment we've ever made in our trains. Uh, uh, again, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but in electrical uh, vehicle charging apparatus and structures. Uh, I think I think those are actions that allow us to say we're really serious about this um, and spending the money and creating the incentives uh, and then the actions of our corporations. Again, I keep coming back, you know, as a Democrat, it's uh, it's maybe a little bit counterintuitive. But, you know, federal government hasn't gotten a minimum wage uh, bill done. But Walmart did. And, you know, fifteen dollars an hour across its stores. Amazon is doing, you know, my I, my sort of hat is off to the ability of the private sector to demonstrate to the world that American companies are going to uh 
are going to take this 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 issue seriously. Oh, very very good. The um, yeah, that's exactly what what we need to do. Um, you know, then uh, going on to to Bill Gates' comments. You know, he's calling for a green industrial revolution. Um, you know, if I could distill that down to a single sort of pursuit, it's it's scaling clean energy technology, which is investing in it and, and building it and making it available broadly, uh, and also uh, putting in place the the financial incentive and disincentive systems that you mentioned earlier uh, to make that happen. And, and he's putting his money where his mouth is, pledging several hundred million. Uh, to support that. So, so when it comes to investing in, in sustainable technology, green technology, um, you know, what, what are some of the ideas or, or opinions or even specific, you know, programs that you're following or interested in that, that, you know, you want to cover for uh, the, the CIO group? Well, I, I guess two things to say about that, John, just to repeat what I said earlier. Um, there would be one very simple and straightforward way to, um, uh, to really drive a free market solution to uh, uh, to, to transitioning to uh, the kind of world that Bill Gates is talking about, uh, a much more sustainable world. That would be, of course, to correctly price carbon. And that would take the form of, uh, you know, a cap and trade arrangement or much more likely, much more popular in the uh, a, a sort of uh, political world now, a, uh, you know, a royalty or a tax on, on, on carbon. And by the way, you know, this is something that achieves um, support on the right wing as well, you know, so long as it's fully refundable. Uh, there are a lot of Republican colleagues who are willing to talk about a carbon, they don't call it a tax, they call it a royalty or a fee, whatever, um, so long it is as, as it is fully refundable, which, by the way, has some really attractive at attributes to it, right? It tends to be very progressive because, you know, lower income people have smaller carbon footprints than those who are, you know, regularly flying to Vail. Um, but, you um, uh, uh, you know, anyway, that sadly is not on the table. And instead, we're cobbling together the incentives, the nudges, the subsidies, in some very small cases, the penalties um, that push us in that direction. Um, and, you know, I do think that that'll be effective in combination with what I said earlier, consumer preference. Um, the, but the other thing that we haven't talked about this morning that I think is really important, and I spend a lot of time pushing this, um, the other thing that we are going to do and have been doing to some extent is, you know, a lot of basic R&D inside the federal government. I mean, I, I, I wave this thing around. We're all communicating on, a, on, you know, some version of that device. I wave that around a lot to demonstrate the model that I think works, right? This is made by a private corporation, uh, made a lot of people very wealthy, but pretty much everything that's cool about this was developed originally in a, you know, in some sort of DARPA, you know, DOE program, whether it was the internet or the GPS satellites that are up there or, or, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, we have a huge role to play in the public realm in doing the R&D um, that leads to, uh, you know, on one extreme, uh, the sort of more reasonable extreme, uh, uh, you know, much more efficient photovoltaics, battery, by the way, not many people know it, but the story of the American advancement in battery technology, which was largely driven by federal commitments to R&D is a remarkable story, to on the far extreme of, you know, kind of Star Trek land, um, you know, things like things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, fusion power, uh, modular nuclear, those kinds of things that there's a real role for us to play, us being the uh, federal government in investing in that in that very basic R&D. Uh, very, very, very good point. Um, so let's let's take it now down to the district level here. Um, you know, the the fourth district is is, you know, a good portion of Fairfield County, just for, for folks that don't know the, the limits of it. So when it comes to, you know, sustainability, technology, uh, you know, climate change, all those things down here at the district level, you know, what are some of the things that, that you'd like to see or that you're working on, you know, here in the district uh, that that matter to sustainability and, and climate change? Yeah, that's, that, that's a great question, right? And to some extent, John, it's easier here. And what I mean by that is that we've got, an, you know, here in Fairfield County, we have a moderate, educated, by and large affluent, not, uni not uniformly affluent, but moderate, educated, affluent population. Uh, you know, folks that can afford thinking about buying um, EV vehicles, uh, uh, folks that, you know, can spend more for a product that costs more because it's sustainably produced. Um, so sort of, I hesitate to use um, Fairfield County as perhaps the, you know, the, the icon, the archetype for, uh, for how we operate abroad. Obviously very different in, you know, Ohio or Wyoming, where an awful lot of people are making their living um, uh, in natural gas or coal. Um, but nonetheless, your question is really valid. Um, you know, what's important? 
um, you know, uh, thinking about how we live, uh, move and work, right? Uh, Connecticut is making a real commitment helped by the federal government to um, allowing that guy in Wilton uh, or Branchville or Ridgefield to actually get to New York or Stanford by train. Realistically, that hasn't been possible in the last 20 years. We've allowed our mass transit, our trains in particular, to you know, get to a state where they're actually a lot less efficient than they were 100 years ago or 80 years ago. So we're going to change that. Um, you know, we, we've all learned a heck of a lesson, here we are on Zoom, about whether we all need to constantly be flying to Cleveland or Cincinnati or Dallas for the work that we do, or even going into the office, right? These are going to have profound effects on, uh, on, um, on our carbon footprint over time. Um, you know, distance learning, uh, uh, telemedicine, right? Um, 10 years ago, you got a sniffle, you were, you know, driving seven miles to go to the doctor's office, parking, et cetera. You know, now we're going to do a lot of, you know, if there's a silver lining in, in this pandemic, it's that we've really learned that a lot of what we thought we used to need to burn a lot of, you know, uh, carbon to achieve, we can actually do through this mechanism. And, you know, I think, I think um, Fairfield County, because we have a corporate orientation, we've got a lot of the thought leaders uh, on, uh, and I don't mean just Fairfield County, I mean, you know, the Northeast generally, we've got real, real private sector thought leaders on how to be smarter about that stuff. Great. And so let's, you know, that is incredible context. Uh, I hope everybody found that, that helpful, just sort of doing a, a top review from Fed down to local of what's going on and, and what Jim is seeing and hearing out there and, and some of his opinions on that. Let's shift it for the balance over to the to the CIOs directly. So uh, we have some homework for, for all of you. I'm sure you figured that that was going to happen today. Um, so, you know, COVID obviously has made digital adoption accelerate incredibly much faster. Um, you know, it's stressing organizations, power, tech, all of that. Um, and, you know, business leaders and CIOs, we heard it in the opening, they're, they're being tapped hire even up into the C-suite and the board to advise on or create policy. Um, and so this is a very unique moment in time where, where the CIOs are going to be able to help craft that up into their companies. So what, what are some of the things that, that folks in the CIO role can or should be doing or thinking about as, as they get tapped you know, for new initiatives leading their organizations in, in technology and sort of addressing any one of the, the challenges that we talked about earlier today? Um, John, let me, let me, let me say two things. Um, uh, we, we at every level, um, municipal, state, and federal need to hear from uh, C-suite executives uh, on the, the impediments that exist to uh, a transition to a more sustainable uh, economy. And by the way, conscious as I am that we're here with CIOs, um, that, that is not limited to uh, the topic at hand. Uh, we're having an incredibly robust conversation in DC. We're doing a lot on the issue of cybersecurity. So again, there is a temptation uh, and, a, and a, a, a bias in government to sort of make progress with the door closed and, you know, gosh, I, I've got this great idea. Um, you guys need to be insistent to be in my office and the senator's offices and, you know, Pelosi and McConnell and Schumer's offices really saying, here's what we see, here's what we need your help on. Um, and uh, that doesn't just mean we need more subsidy for this particular technology. Um, it means helping us think through how we deal with disruptive technologies, right? I mean, I keep referring to West Virginia, right? Um, makes me nuts when people don't acknowledge that there are communities that if we were able to do what the environmentalist movement wants us to do, which is snap our fingers and be in a purely sustainable world, there are communities that would be left in, 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 in tragic circumstances. So we need, we need good thinking on that stuff too. I mean, we're talking about a transition here. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story, you know, uh, John, you you noticed this in Stanford. You know, yay, we got a we got a new parking garage built for our uh, for our train station there. The single biggest train station between New York and Boston, right? And uh, you know, it's been such a pain in the neck for so many people. And um, you know, all of us just get obliterated for building a parking garage, right? Because parking is for cars. And and uh, um, you know, we uh, we um, you know, so so I tell that story to indicate the fact that we need 
your advice and your help on how we do as smooth and as rapid a transition to a much more sustainable energy world uh, uh, than we can. By the way, I'll give you one last example. Um, you know, you made reference to this earlier. There's a lot of politics involved in this conversation, but it, it is personally devastating to me as somebody who's focused on innovation that because we've had a crew of people in the country who have wanted to be sort of backward looking on this stuff for good reason, again, remember that community in West Virginia, we are seeding an awful lot of innovative ground to places like China and Europe, you know, and that's never happened before, right? I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> in the technology, the IT revolution and the initial communications revolution, you name it, we were always up front. And the value creation and the wealth creation was massive. And I just don't want to seed that to, um, you know, uh, to some really powerful and increasingly innovative economies in, in Asia and Europe. And we need your help to, to you know, I'm a former banker who knows a little bit about affordable housing. We need all of your help to tell us how we sort of craft the structures and the laws that help us uh, retain that competitive edge. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, so it, let's say, for example, um, and you, co you covered some of this, but just wondering about like some specifics, you know, I'm, I'm a CIO and I get the mandate from the CEO that says, okay, we, we know we need to be acting differently. We need, we know we need to be doing more. Um, so taking from your last comments, you need to talk to Congressman Himes' office, you need to approach the feds, but are there, are there any other, you know, programs or involvement opportunities, councils, committees, any, anywhere where folks who want to either gather information or, or help outwardly can, can go, you know, is specific to sustainability, climate change, or any of the things we've been discussing? Sure. Look, I think I think the overall watchword is participation at every level. Um, and let me be balanced in how I sort of give you an example here. Um, uh, we, we owe it to be really serious and fact-based and analytical in how we proceed here. And that means just to be fair to both sides of the political spectrum, you know, that means that we need the more exuberant uh, ideas of, you know, of, of the left to acknowledge that we're doing a transition and that that transition will involve natural gas. There's just no two ways about it, right? And so we need sobriety there. Um, on the other end of the political spectrum, more on the right, we need uh, the chamber uh, and groups like API, which has actually really evolved. The American Petroleum Institute, which used to be dead set against any of this stuff, is actually kind of coming around. We need those groups to say, we're in too. Um, you know, we're going to continue to guard our, our fiduciary obligations to our shareholders, et cetera, but we're in too. So at some level, it's pretty simple, John, which is we need the business community to take a sober, pragmatic approach to this and help um, both sides of the political spectrum move towards sort of a more pragmatic outlook. Wonderful. And let's... Um... Let's just circle it back to, to one more sort of big topic, recent, recent development here um, that we didn't get a chance to cover earlier, uh, the Paris Climate Accord. So obviously, you know, going back a little ways, uh, the US exited that accord, uh, now has re-entered it. Uh, wondering if in general, you have any opinion on, on either the accord leaving or re-entering, and uh, if anything's going to be different this time around, uh, you know, with Biden at the helm. Yeah, um, I mean, just to sort of reiterate something I said, John, I, I'm glad we're back in. I'm glad that we're doing the symbolic things that, uh, that put us at the, you know, back at the leadership table. But, you know, because I'm getting old and grumpy, I'm actually much more interested in kind of what we do than what we say. I mean, you all know that, look, I think Paris is a really good thing. Um, but you all know that pretty much everybody is falling short of their Paris targets. So again, maybe I'm just getting grumpy in my old age, but what I really want to see is I want to see the initiatives that allow us to uh, move in the direction, which we are, of achieving um, the goals that we set for ourselves. And, but don't get me wrong, I, I, I do think the symbolic you know, commitments and that sort of thing are, 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 are important, are important. The world needs to know that uh, that we're doing this because, you know, at the end of the day, you asked a question about Fairfield County. You know, we could be as virtuous as all get out, but this is a global problem, right? Um, and we need to have the standing to talk to China about how they reduce the rate at which they're building new coal burning plants if we're going to solve this global problem. And, and the symbolic stuff does help in that regard, but it's not as powerful as actually 
show in the numbers um, that the initiatives that we're taking are actually making us leaders in this in this in this uh, endeavor. Oh, beautiful. The um, I think we have time to take one question from the audience here. Um, it's something that I should have probably asked you in the first five minutes. Uh, and it's one that I'm sure every single CIO here uh, is curious on the answer on. And, and that's uh, ransomware. And so a, a lot of these folks are responsible for preventing that and responding to it when it does happen. So if, if someone leading an organization is hit with a ransomware attack, um, you know, how, how do they communicate with, with the government? You know, where do they get started? Where can they go to get advice? Uh, do you have any, any thoughts on that or, or ideas on, on responding to ransomware attacks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks for the question. Very much a focus of my work on the Intelligence Committee and just generally important to me. Um, and by the way, America really sat up when, uh, when the Colonial Pipeline got hit and, uh, you know, City of Baltimore and the list goes on. So uh, the one minute version, uh, the one minute version, John, my answer to you is um, we're actually making really good progress at the state and federal level. In, um, in setting up the kind of communication that we need, right? This goes back to 2015 when we passed the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act. Very, very hard to do. You'll recall that said that, you know, if, you, if the private sector um, sent malware and it contained PII, uh, that there would be sort of a safe harbor against lawsuits for the, for, the, for the communication of that malware to Homeland Security and ultimately to NSA, FBI, et cetera, the three letter agencies. We need to do a lot more of that, and we need the private sector to be, you know, to, to, to be a partner in that regard. Now, I understand that that also means that we need to do what we did here in the state of Connecticut very recently, where a, a bill passed. I'm not an expert on it because I'm not a Connecticut legislator, legislator, but we passed into law um, a safe harbor against punitive damages for those businesses in Connecticut that, uh, that are attacked and, um, and uh, you know, have a PII out there, provided that they... Um, that they abided by a, 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 a sort of a, a defined set of best practices. So uh, we really need to up that level of communication and nothing would make me happier than to hear, not, not in this venue, but to hear from all of your members here, how we can do better in that regard. Cause you know, we're just, we cannot have what we had with Colonial Pipeline where the government didn't know that it had happened until it was too late. We didn't even know if they'd paid a ransom. Um, you know, we just need to, we, we need to set up that context for information sharing. The folks at NSA and FBI and DHS are as good as they come. Uh, you know, these guys get bought away to go work and uh, to be CIOs and CTOs elsewhere. Um, and we just need that partnership. Lastly, I can tell you, we're going on the offense in a very big way. I see this a lot through my seat on the intelligence committee. You know, we are taking the money back as we did in the case of Colonial Pipeline. Uh, we are disrupting networks. We are, uh, you know, naming and shaming. Um, uh, we are going after uh, the Russian government, which in many instances is sort of providing an umbrella to some of these groups. Um, I'm not going to tell you that's necessarily going to be a successful effort anytime soon. But the point is we're going on the offense in a very big way. That's not going to solve the problem, but um, I am really adamant that sovereign and non-sovereign players come to understand that they screw around with our pipelines, they screw around with our cities or our major corporations, our critical infrastructure, there will be a very, very high price to pay. And I'm Glad to tell you, uh, not in too much detail, that in uh, you know uh, places inside the NSA and Cyber Command, that's a that's very much a, a value that is being pushed to the for the forefront. Oh, very very nice, very <clears throat> a lot of lot of uh, good ideas there as far as how to get involved. And glad to hear the U.S. is is stepping up and uh, like you said, going on the attack. So uh, really nice. The um, all right, I think that's uh, just a quick time check here. Um, that's going to be all we have time here today. So um, I'll thank uh, Congressman uh, Jim Himes one more time on, on behalf of uh, the organizing group here, as well as everybody in attendance today. Uh, certainly been, been my pleasure. And Jim, thank you for all your work that you do for, for this district and uh, for this country. Very much appreciate it. And uh, with, that, with that said, if you have any closing thoughts, please go ahead and then uh, we'll pass it back to the organizers. No, um, uh, thanks, John. Thanks really very much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, I guess I'm not really meeting you all. I'm just looking at, at avatars here, but um, it's, it's great to meet you all. And let me just close with what I said before. We succeed here by working together and by hearing from you all what's working, what we're doing that is good ideas, what we're doing that are bad ideas. And so, you know, um, really, really hope we have more opportunities to, this wasn't really a conversation. This was largely me talking, but, but more opportunities for dialogue. Thank you. Thank you again, Jim.